Okay, so our guest today, you guys wear a lot of hats, so I'll try and uh, I'll try and get through this. Rob McDowell, who is a consultant, former diplomat. Yeah, you bet. And uh, also was a uh, former city councillor candidate. Yes, uh, two times. <laughs> excellent. Well, welcome, Rob. And then, of course, past guest, fan favorite, Adrian Crook, uh, rental and housing advocate and former city councillor candidate. Welcome to you both. Uh, can you start, um, maybe, Rob, by telling us a little bit about yourself? Oh, sure. Um, as you mentioned, I was in uh, Asia for about 12 years. I am from Vancouver. I was actually born in Burnaby, but uh, grew up here, uh, was in uh, Vietnam with the embassy in Hanoi, opened that up wow. uh, with the trade section, moved down to Ho Chi Minh City, where I was the director of the trade office for Canada, and then up to Beijing, where I worked for the, it was the Canada-China Business Council, which is the big uh, political body to, to organize those Team Canada events in uh, China. And then I was the consul in Guangzhou. Right. It's amazing. Did, did you get the, the red plate on your car? Yes, I did. And I had and, the red and, passport, too. And, Ooh. What is I that? I know, it was fancy. Does that you plate had to go give to you a special, special... Well, yeah, it did. But mostly it meant that you got pulled over a lot. Really? <laughs> and also with the diplomatic passport, it was always kind of embarrassing because there'd be a big line and you'd have to go to the special diplomat line and I would always get yelled at. And wow. you're but, in the wrong line. And then you have to hold it up and, and like 500 people look at you going, yeah. oh, what an... <laughs> Anyways, yes. Wait, but do you get immunity? Is that is that actually a thing uh, as well? Consular immunity is a bit different than diplomatic immunity. You committed I was a lot of crimes. <laughs> a lot of crimes. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you, you uh, were able to do things, but what would you do? I do mean, you, it doesn't uh, make any sense. Double park? Do you, yeah, do you obey the speed limit or no? Uh, it was China and it was <laughs> Vietnam, so there would be a lot of, uh, you know, in, in actually in Hanoi, when I first started going to the embassy, I'd ride my bike like everybody did in those days. It was a bicycle city. And I remember the cops would hide behind the post. And if, it was a, if, you, read through a, if you rode through a red light, they would step out and smack you in the back. And it was like such an amazing way to wake up in the morning, like at 6.30 in the morning. And of course, they would target the foreigners. But that was it? That was like double. Oh, yeah, it was total corporal punishment. It's like, bam. That's, it, there's no tickets, right? So yeah. anyways, oh, that's, that's what I got. Oh, thank you. That's hilarious. And, and Adrian, <laughs> yeah. good luck beating up, Adrian. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I didn't well, I live in Yale Town. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Really boring compared to that. Uh, well, geez. I mean, sometimes I still write that Five Kids, One Condo blog um, right. that I think I was on geez, yeah. a few years ago. That was. That was probably... That was a huge blog, especially oh, in Vancouver, as everything yeah. was transitioning into condo That's life right. for, yeah, exactly. for most of us. That's where I was first called a uh, shill for the real estate industry, I think. So, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's see. Um, I co-founded Abundant Housing Vancouver and Abundant Transit BC. Uh, I am the spokesperson for PC Rental Project, uh, which is a group that advocates for uh, rental housing policy changes at the provincial and municipal level. And of course, I have five kids, and uh, I think... Uh, some people might remember the uh, whole kids on the bus sort of case where the Ministry of Children and Family Development here in BC had waded in in uh, spring of 2017 and said that I couldn't let my kids take the bus uh, on their own to and from their school um, or be left alone anywhere, anytime, actually, for that matter, until they were uh, ages 10 or, and over. Um, so we took that to court. We raised a bunch of money and took that to court. And uh, and we're still fighting that, actually. We're in appeals now um, this spring. So. Wow. When and you're so you're going to the Supreme Court of Canada. You're appealing it. No, is this a, the next step is the BC Court of Appeals, which is the okay. highest court of, in, in BC, and that's a three judge panel. What's been the reaction to that uh, to that case? Like, have, mm -hmm. have, you, have you heard from a lot of people? Uh, hundreds. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's been. But has anyone crazy. agreed with with the other side? <laughs> I feel like you're so clearly you're so clearly on the right side of history because you're mm -hmm. you're the story. If anyone doesn't know it, is your kids had been riding the bus for a long time with you. They had cell phones. They were they were fully prepared. The youngest was what seven or eight. Yeah. So at the time of this, they were ten, nine. The old, the oldest four were taking the bus. They were ten, nine, eight, and six. I think. And yeah. but and somebody saw them riding the bus together and reported right. it. Right. And yeah. who does that? Who does that? Exactly. And there was no incident or anything like there's never been a safety incident with the kids on the bus and their bus drivers are all hugely supportive and offered to write us letters of support. And even the ministry said that I had gone above and beyond what any parent could be expected to do to train their kids to take the bus. But uh, it was one of those things where the ministry has sort of an unwritten rule around age 10. 
And they, uh, even the first time they visited me on this, uh, when they sort of first commenced their investigation, uh, they said 10 was the age and they, they pretty much hewed to that and stuck to that throughout. So. That must have been, did they come to your house? This reminds yeah, me of yeah. marriage story. I don't know if you guys have seen, seen that. Totally. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious. You're like, and this is a normal way we eat dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they did. I mean, they came to the house initially to talk to me, and then they talked to the kids at the school. It was, you know, it's not a great process. Like, as the ministry pointed out, even during our uh, trial back in September, when we first took them to court, like every parent lives in fear of the ministry giving them a call one day. And that's really the heart of this is that power and balance that the ministry has to kind of yeah. essentially make you do things that uh, maybe they shouldn't be able to make you do. Right. Well, good luck with that. Thanks. That's uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, honestly, it does seem like you're so clearly on the right side of history here that uh, I hope that it works out in the way the way that it should. Um, maybe we the reason we asked you guys on today is uh, you guys follow city politics pretty closely. You're also um, both very active and and both I would say ideas guys, right? You have a lot of ideas. Um, maybe a, a good way to get into what's going on in Vancouver and and some of the the positives and negatives is you've run once, you've run twice for city council. Why why did you guys run, Rob? Like what what was uh, what was the impetus? Um, well, for me, uh, I have some good friends from Expo eighty six, so it goes back to those days. But we all live together. We all got apartments next door to each other, and. Uh, one of them is now the city engineer, Lon LeClaire, and the other one is George Affleck, who's, they were both really good friends of mine. So we all bought together, we all lived together in this complex, we all are excited about the city, we all want to do something. And for it's George like and I, it was, row it was really, uh, <laughs> George and I, it was really a toss up, like who was going to run first? And so he ran first in uh, 2011, and uh, I helped him with the campaign. Uh, and he got in right away, so we weren't expecting that. And he actually got elected, and he ran. He was on city council for two terms, so I helped him with that uh, in that time. And I certainly saw the upside and the downside to it by helping him, and I decided I would throw my hat in the ring as well. Just, just thinking, though, you guys are all, you're, you're, you're young men. What You're excited about the city. What, yeah. Like, what was going on in the city that, like, wh oh, where the whole this idea of like from, living like, downtown, the dynamic nature of living yeah. downtown. We were some of the first people that lived in Yelltown. So that was in, well, it was in 2000. We bought our place in 1997, all of us in a row. Um, and we were moving in on January 1st, 2000. So that was really exciting for all of us. Mm hmm. And and did you see when you when you actually put your your hat in the ring in 2014, which is a which is a pretty uh, what it takes a, a, a some courage for sure. I would I would guess at least if from my perspective, um, putting yourself out there like that. Like was there was there uh, a few issues that you saw that you were like, okay, this is why I want to get involved. Like the, or was it more like? Hey, I can I can do this as well as anyone. I mean, else. you have to have the core issues, you know. You got to have the brand, and you have to have the, the issue that's tied to your name. And for me, it was definitely I was in, interested in housing, but in transportation as well. So those those two were really key for me. But um, uh, that that was what drove me in my campaign. Right. Yeah. And Adrian, I think we know you from uh, uh, abundant housing and things like that. Um, why did you decide to run? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I had started getting into city things with that, you know, with my blog that sort of led, led me to meet the people that we started, you know, abundant housing and then abundant transit with. And you wind up uh, just in a lot of sort of uh, municipal and just to a lesser extent provincial government circles. You you know, you're meeting with and talking to people um, of inf influence, and it occurs that, to you that maybe this is another way to affect change. Um, I'm constantly torn as to whether it's better to try to affect change from within or without. Uh, everything I'm doing these days is obviously without. I didn't get elected. Um, and in some ways, that's slightly more, well, maybe I'm just rational, rationalizing post-losing, but in some ways that's more, more uh, gratifying. <laughs> no, I don't know about effective, but more gratifying because like you 
you can set your own pace. Uh, you can try things. You can move quickly. Um, you can agitate in ways that you can't really do from within, where it's more about just kind of working to build consensus very, very, very slowly. Um, so I, I'm always back and forth on, on whether or not I do it again. Interesting. So we just had, we were talking before we went live, like we just had Gil Kelly on the show. And uh, what came from that is, you know, we, we were talking to him about the city plan and, and how Vancouver's really at a crossroads right now is, was his point. And we have to make some, some big and uh, bold decisions, I guess, moving forward. But from your guys' perspective, are we at a crossroads and and what is what is the city getting right and what is the city getting wrong right now? Before we get into mm. specific counselors, that's the rest of the show. That right? really is the entire. <laughs> that's like another forty five minutes. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, in uh, in fairness to Gil, like we've sort of been at a crossroads for years now. I would say, and we've been at a you know more like a stalemate for even longer um, when it comes to major reforms. Like what I part of what I ran on and what you saw one city run on was um, opening up every neighborhood for everyone, I think was the one city tagline, which is basically just getting rid of detached zoning as a, the, you know, the zoning form that dominates 70 plus percent of our land use here in Vancouver residentially. So that to me should have been, I mean, we've already seen that happen in uh, Oregon. Oregon had a statewide bill that uh, had mandatory minimum zoning for cities over 25,000. We've seen uh, Scott Wiener in California be trying to do that now for years with uh, SB 827 and most recently SB 50 that was uh, sort of shot down, unfortunately. But essentially just, you know, that those bills were uh, upzoning around transit and job-rich neighborhoods. I think Washington State is now looking at mandatory uh, minimum zoning. So part of what I've been doing lately is trying to appeal to the province to look at that. I don't think the province has the guts to do anything about it, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we've got a lot of long overdue land use reforms in the city that uh, hopefully city plan brings us, but I'm not overly optimistic, especially since the outcome of city plan is not actually any prescriptive zoning changes, uh, according to what we've heard. I, I think the problem with city plan is that it means it's, it means something to everyone and it means nothing to like no one, right? It's like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I can get behind that. As, as a, as a, as a course concept, it's fantastic to a yeah. lot of people, yeah. but it really, now that the rubber is hitting the road, it's, we're kind of seeing what they mean by city plan. And there are some concerns with it. We've always had neighborhood plans one by one in the pipeline. And we've, you know, the West End plan was done a couple of years ago, the Marple plan, the Kensington plan, the downtown east side plan, yeah, the Grandview Woodland plan. Um, they're, they're huge. They take a lot of work and millions of millions of dollars each and a lot of community buy-in yeah. and participation. And those are always in the pipeline. So there's always two underway. We've stopped all those now and we're doing this city plan. So we've stopped all that. Um, and let's mention too, that most of the development in the city has happened in the four neighborhood plans that, that were, were finished. So we're not doing anymore. There's none in the pipeline. We're doing this city plan. Nobody knows what it means. And if we look at Probably the best example, I think, is looking back at the um, um, community center issue, which was we had 22 community centers all over the all over the city. The Vision Vancouver, the party at the time, decided they would come up with sort of a unified plan for them. Every neighborhood was up in arms, and it was very, very divisive, if you remember. That could have led to the end of Penny Bellum's reign in, in, in City Hall as the city manager. So if we look at that model, I, I, I don't think... It bodes well for the city plan either for the same reason. There are very different neighborhoods. It's going to be really difficult to get them all online and in line and uh, paddling the same direction in the same boat. And I just the more I think about this, the more I think it shouldn't be an issue left to individual municipalities, especially when you have the province with sort of critical infrastructure uh, projects providing 40 percent of the funding. It should be the province that wades in and says, hey, Port Moody, for instance, who, you know, you've got a West Coast Express station, you've got two SkyTrain stations, stop dicking around. Yeah. You can't, I, we're, you know, I don't care what you think you should use your downtown area for. It has to be at least this much used for jobs and, and you know, residential uses because we've invested billions or, you know, hundreds of millions or whatever it is there. Um, that, you know, that has to happen at that level. Otherwise, we get sort of NIMBY councils like you see in West Van or District of North Vancouver or Port Moody that can sort of quite frankly pander to um, like 
people of my parents' cohort that are comfortably mm -hmm. housed and uh, just, you know, using their house as an ATM at this point in life and don't really need their neighborhood changing any further. Yeah. Right. Part of, part of the, uh, part of uh, our conversation with Gil Kelly surrounded this kind of this cohesive identity that, that the city should have, like, who are we as a, as a municipality, the city of Vancouver? Um, and it kind of seems like that process is a bit of a, a soul searching one of trying to figure out. And that's, I think what, I, how we, how he framed it as kind of at the crossroads of like, we don't know what we are as a city. Do you guys, do you, do you feel like there's value there in, in, in that process? Or do you think it's even a necessary process for the city to, to explore? I just worry that it's going to be a lot of virtue signaling and kind of, of course, mm -hmm. everyone's going to agree. We want to be a cohesive, mm -hmm. welcoming city Inclusive. and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what does it mean? Does it mean we have to have apartments right next to, yeah. you know, our homes or whatever? It's, it's, uh, it depends once we drill down to what that actually means. Practically. Yeah. Yeah. It just feels like we've done these kind of exercises a lot in the past. I, that level of abstraction isn't what's needed at this point. Like I was thinking the other day, and this is like really gross, is, is sort of just more like a, like a thought exercise. But if you've got a street in your town that's named Broadway, perhaps you should have built up to 50 stories on that. And if you have one that's named commercial, <laughs> perhaps 25 stories. And if they intersect, now add the two. Now you got 75 stories. That should be our city plan. <laughs> but seriously, they were arguing over like 20 or 30 stories at Broadway and commercial, one of the mm. busiest transit hubs in well, in the province, of Canada, yeah. mm -hmm. really, uh, it just speaks to how provincial, and I mean that in the pejorative sense, a lot of our <laughs> municipal thinking is these days. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is, you, you know, Gil is a persuasive guy, mm -hmm. um, but it does seem like, uh, you know, we've had basically, we've been in crisis here for pretty, coming on a decade. Um, and the city plan is like, in theory, seems like a very kind of interesting thing to kind of hit pause and spend a couple years uh, throwing ideas, tossing ideas <laughs> and, about. And generating a feedback loop, and, right? And, and, Which right. is a big part of Which it. Which I think they're actually having trouble getting a lot of that they feedback, are. as yeah. I understand. For sure. Uh, because, you know, people are busy and... And they've been burned too many times with the neighborhood. Well, yeah. right. and, and sometimes the people that speak up are the people that... that What's well, the loudest voices, yeah. right? Yeah. It's the same voices every time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I don't know, we, we are already, already sort of by default doing a great job of hitting pause, <laughs> yeah. you know, like we, I think what did we hit maybe half of our rental housing targets last yeah. year in terms right. of approval. So right. it's pretty darn paused. I think what was in 2018, we built something like 1300 rental units in Seattle built 17,000 or mm -hmm. something like that. So we are thoroughly in, you know, park right now in terms yeah. of gears. <laughs> why, and why do you guys think like, in a city that so clearly needs more housing, um, like where you see places like Seattle, you just mentioned, where they're, I mean, it's a larger center, I guess, but but why are they so much, why are we so bad? As, and specifically, I know you, you we can point to other uh, municipalities, but the city of Vancouver seems not great at um, at getting stuff built or even getting those applications passed, right? And I, I would guess you were involved in the, the large, uh, the the large apartments. You're Broadway probably, and Larch, yeah. yeah, Broadway and Larch, and yeah. and others as well. Like, what what is it? What's specific to Vancouver that makes us particularly bad at building? I mean, personally, I think it's leadership and the lack of leadership. This is political capital that you need to ex expand, right? To 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 achieve that sort of level of density, and there's just no willingness to use the, the political capital of the politicians that are in the city right now to, on that purpose. There, mm -hmm. there, we have five different parties in in city council let's have 10 councillors and one independent mayor like there's no cohesive leadership there everybody's trying to prove themselves trying to feed back to their own party apparatus to ensure that they're all keen and still hyped up on whatever issues they have which is not housing and well it's sorry we talk about homelessness and housing of course being important and affordability but nobody is willing to approve what needs to be approved which is higher density and allowable build in certain areas that that obviously should have it. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of it is sort of um, the worse economics of rental versus condo. Uh, I think part of the distortion in the Seattle market is that there there is a large, or there was until recently, a lot of potential liability in building condo. I think you were right. on the hook for, sure. yeah, exactly, things down the line. I think they've addressed that now. Um, but, you know, also here, 
it's seven years to go from uh, sort of pre-application inquiry to a finished uh, rental housing development. And a huge chunk of that is thing, uh, something like pre-application inquiry, which is like a year or something of that process. You know, why are we forcing rental housing to go through the same hoops that condo goes through when the economics are already worse? It's harder for them to secure money, to borrow money. It's you know, condo can just kick off once they've got a certain amount of pre-sales. There's not the same kind of thing with rental. Mm -hmm. It's a tough business to be in for rental housing operators. It's not the same kind of margins as condo. So if we want to incentivize that, we really have to put our whole hand on the scale and not just a finger. And and, and to Rob's point, there just is not the uh, will to drop the political capital on, you know, with a stroke of a pen, getting rid of some of these uh, sort of artificial drags on the rental housing uh, providers. Mm Mm-hmm. If, if there's not the political will at this point, <laughs> uh, does it ex- is it possible for it to exist? It seems like we're at a point now where, um, like, what is it going to take, right? Because we're in a, a situation in which, um, you know, the market's fairly distorted across the board, I would say. Uh, and it seems like it's going to remain that way. And it's very difficult for a lot of people to live in the city uh, day to day. And it does feel like, you know, certain communities are being hollowed out. Like, at what point do you think that this, the the scale is going to tip? Crystal ball time, I guess. <laughs> That's a really good question because, like you said, it feels like it's been about ten years of this, um, and we see, you know, the latest issue is obviously that that's been in the news recently is all the um, school catchment stuff, which right. obviously is a provincial issue, right? Um, but just how out of sync we've been here with the province in, you know, our emphasis on encouraging urban living, like Rob saying, you know, moving into Yale Town, as mm-hmm. I think you were mentioned, you were one of the first settlers of Yale Town. I that? didn't say settler, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. How gauche. Uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, yeah, like I bought into that and I've bought into it throughout my life. It's not the first time I've lived in Yale Town now. And, um, so I, you know, this hasn't snuck up on us. Like we've been aware of what we're doing as a municipality and the province has been aware of it too forever. And yet we still have massive systemic issues that prevent growth. Uh, so schools being one of them and obviously the approval of rental housing, which is, you know, immune to speculation and generally more tied to local wages than condo development would be. So we, you would think everyone could, could agree that we need to accelerate the construction of rental housing, but we cannot apparently. And the city, and the just to be clear, the school issue is is it's the crosstown school, right? The new school that was built. This is what spurred it's on the the lack the, of Olympic Village as yeah. a school, elementary school, the lack of Cole Harbor. As I mean, these are communities. Yeah. Cole Harbor. I mean, how long has Cole Harbor been around now? Mm-hmm. Twenty mm-hmm. plus 20 years? years. Yeah, Olympic Village maybe a little less, but anything um, north of Sixteenth really is there's an issue with schooling. Right. South of Sixteenth, not a problem. Yeah, right? those mm-hmm. schools are empty or emptying out. Right, yeah. but north of Sixteenth, it's it's a huge problem in terms of schooling. The schools were really just sprinkled around in a pattern that would re- serve like a largely suburban density, and then of course when you get into urban densities like this, they can't take up the capacity of the people that live there anymore. Mm-hmm. Not even close. There are more elementary students and kindergarten and elementary students on a wait list now than there are actually enrolled. So. We're way out of scale for the in terms of solutions. Hmm. That making you nervous? He just had a baby. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Off to you the got suburbs. five years. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'm curious because uh, Adrian, you you do a lot on the on the rental housing side as well, and you're an advocate, like you said. Can you talk about maybe like some of the some of the things that your group is advocating in terms of rents? Like, do, are you in support of rent control, mm-hmm. and how does that connect to to incentives for developers to build rental housing? And and maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I mean, I can, I don't really speak for abundant housing anymore. I'm not a director there. I resigned that position when I was running for city council uh, for obvious reasons. I still do. I'm involved in helping them out here and there. Uh, but I know they have the uh, same position that we do at BC Rental Project, which is that we are not in support of rent control. There are numerous uh, sort of economic studies that show that rent control is bad for uh, housing supply, rental housing supply. So right. it seems counterintuitive. I'm a renter myself. I would love lower rents, um, but I want more 
uh, choices in terms of rental stock more more than that. I want to be able to make my landlord sweat because uh, I could move next door if I wanted to if things got really bad. You know, totally. Like, yeah. You go down to Seattle and there are, there are va- rental vacancy signs out front of buildings. Like, I can think of one building that new Peter Wall development right mm-hmm. on the same block you live on actually mm-hmm. that has had a vacancy sign out. Um, in this town, and I don't think I can think of any others. The one at corner of uh, Drake and Richards. Richards, that's yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. They, okay. Really, they have vacancy. Yes. Yeah, and I mean that. I guess is always the concern because we've uh, certain developers in the city have identified that they'll be building kind of more luxury rental housing, mm-hmm. kind of targeting. I was going to say those rents are, are high, though, right? Yeah, that's yeah. and that's what that makes me think. But this, right? but this is another thing, and this is a, pro- a trap we get into a lot, like. If you look at actually the demographics of Grandview Woodland over the last like two, three decades, um, they've shifted dramatically from it being a low income community to it being like a better income, you know, Mm -hmm. middle income or or higher income community. And they haven't built anything. And so you get um, you get displacement, whether you build or not, actually, you get more of it if you don't build, because those people that come into town and start working for Amazon, they need to live somewhere. And if they can afford a luxury rental apartment, they can live there. If they can't afford that, they're gonna go into, you know, third and Woodland and rent Mm -hmm. an apartment there. And that person that was in their apartment before is going even further out. So that's, yeah, and that's generally why I support rental housing supply, even if it's at the higher end of the market, because the fact that the economics are that you cannot, without a huge subsidy from some level of government build you can't build below market housing out of the box. So mm-hmm. it will necessarily be sort of more expensive than older housing stock. I mean, a new car is more expensive than an old one. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't need it. You do need that uh, right. that new housing stock entering the market at some point, and then it can you know, work its way down as it ages. Right. And, and even, I'm just thinking if there's one, like that Peter Wall, everyone knows that building because... Mm-hmm. There hasn't been a new rental building right. built downtown in yeah. a long time, right? So it's uh, like if there's one building being built, like of course it's going to be a, a luxury high end building because the, it just makes sense, right? From like the economics of it. But if you're building uh, building throughout uh, the city, presumably, um, yeah, the newer it's going to factor through the market as it ages for sure. But then there's there's going to be different gradations of new construction. Uh, geared towards different price points and different different needs, right? Yep. Like it just makes sense. But the fact that there's none being built, I guess, like it's not a surprise that it's all ultra luxury, twenty seven hundred for a one bed or whatever. Mm-hmm. That you know, I don't know what those rents are, but I think they're. I think it's a bit less than that. It's got to be twenty three hundred yeah. anyways, or pretty but close to that. We should keep in mind that's fifty four story building that was purpose built rental, and it's you know almost four hundred units that came out to the market just like that. Right next, totally, just down from it is another one that just came on right level and yeah. Charleston and and Charleston at the same be, time. Yeah, and Charleston that's a being luxury, luxury condos sure. where a lot of you, there's just a lot of floors that are just one unit, right. This exact yeah, yeah. Very on the different. other corner, yeah, very right? Different. It's very oh. different product, right? There was also the Sharing Aquilini the development that was a rental. Oh, building, right at right? Uh, close to the Crosstown School, Expo, actually, right? Yeah, yeah right. Expo, and I don't know what the yeah. cross street is there, right between the two arenas or whatever. Right. But I know when the Aquilini building came on and the wall building, and I'm forgetting a third, sort of within the same time frame, there was some speculation that the mm-hmm. area rents had sort of declined marginally. It's very hard to track these things. Usually, you get kind of bad metrics using PadMapper or Craigslist or something, which are very hard to filter out right. crappy data. But it did feel like there was a temporary loosening of uh, of um, rental prices, at least. I check Craigslist for rentals pretty much every week, even though we've been in the same place for about seven and a half years. <laughs> but you kind of want to be prepared to be thrown out at any time. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. What what about um I'm just thinking of all we talk we talk all the time just about the policies that have been put in put into place speculation tax empty homes tax the city kind of cracking down on Airbnb how do you have these policies been effective in your opinion for the rental market Hmm it's very hard to measure uh the Airbnb stuff may be marginally um I don't think you know any one of these things is not a silver bullet uh so I don't, while I don't think they're sort of damaging, um, I don't, I don't put much hope in any of them sort of dramatically changing the fortunes. Uh, I don't know the numbers too much on the empty homes tax. I don't know if you've been following that. Uh, it's, it's a lot less effective than we hoped it would be. That's my takeaway from it. But I mean, 
you're looking at a purpose-built rental policy, right? That's really what you want to push yep. is mm-hmm. just purpose-built rental. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to whatever extent we can return private uh, units to the rental market, that's great. I'm in a private unit right now. Like some, my landlord is, you know, some guy that's run through a property management company. Uh, so uh, that's great. Uh, Cause like I said, I've lived there now for seven and a half years with my kids, which is really atypical for this market. But I, what I want for more people in this market and maybe including myself one day is a uh, secured rental, like purpose-built rental basically. So yeah. you're, if you pay the bills, you're, you will not get whatever rent evicted, whatever you want to call it. Totally. And uh, that's, you know, that's just right now the reality a lot of people live in, especially in like basement suites and a lot of these sort of, uh, when you know, boutique landlords, if you will. <laughs> well, we, we've honestly, uh, I, was, I was just having a conversation with a, f- a friend of uh, a friend of ours last week who has been now, uh, her condo was just sold where she had to leave because an, an owner, an occupier, or yeah. end user bought it. And she moved into a new condo and was informed almost immediately she took over a sublease informed almost immediately that they were selling Mm -hmm. um and i guess she didn't have a full uh lease agreement in place with the landlord because she took over from a friend of hers who was renting it was all in the up and up but she's getting removed and it's it's the cost of i mean the cost to the tenant is is huge right and when you start thinking yeah both financially and and psychologically and energy and and (laughs) everything right taking time off work to to be to move to make meeting all the dates and everything else transferring your tells hanging around for say your internet provider to even well and and then on a in a similar vein what is becoming more and more of a problem is, and i you know i'm in favor of tenant relocation policies like at a municipal level having some good um, guidelines in place for what happens when you've got to sort of update or uh, renovate like a uh, rental property but what's happening now is even if you're giving somebody six months of you know rent to go find some other place they can't find some other place or mm-hmm. six months is not enough or um so you know we're sort of we're downloading these costs of not building enough back onto the very same developers. Whereas if we had a healthy, you know, three to 5% rental vacancy rate, maybe that tenant relocation policy doesn't have to be so, so onerous, so costly because it's more expected that you could find a place, you know, a few blocks away from where you live currently. And I I know you have a really nuanced uh, perspective of what needs to change, but in a lot of ways we have to build it, right? I mean, that's the, that's, yeah, there's there's a lot of there's this appetite in town to kind of find some bogeyman like it's yeah. it's foreign money or mm-hmm. it's money laundering or it's a bunch of empty homes. Uh, and there's a there's been this search for a scapegoat for years. And I don't mind doing things as long as they're not racist or xenophobic around things like foreign money or whatever, like which is always a hole we kind of go down. It feels like as a city Um I don't mind trying things like the empty homes tax or or Airbnb regulations. Uh, because they're probably part of, at least right now, uh, an unhealthy rental market. It's probably part of solving it. Um, but the bottom line is you need to have homes, and we don't build enough homes. And uh, thousands and thousands of people come here every year. And last year, we approved about a 1,000 new rental homes that won't even come online for five or six years. So we're way, way behind the curve on the problem. And we're just, every day, many people are just being forced to move further and further out. And we're building office space downtown it's literally set to house thousands of new workers like the, the Amazon <laughs> building. And, you know, yeah. there've been some beautiful renders of, you know, proposed office Shopify buildings. And yeah. Rest, yeah, yeah. Shopify. Um, but no, it seems like nobody is asking at the municipal leadership level where these people are going to live. And the sad fact is they will just force people, even like me that don't earn as much as them right out of the city because they can outcompete us for rents. So the interesting thing about this is, is I felt like the last, uh, and at least my impression was this was like a, a uh, one of the major cruxes of the last election, right? Mm-hmm. Like housing was a, it was fairly central for sure. Um, and yet, Rob, when we when you were talking earlier, like okay, so what what was the result of that? Well, we have a council, a very diverse council with little to no cohesion, right? right. And and not the political capital or political will to do anything. Like how being in the trenches during that uh, election, like how do we end up with, with uh, such a diverse, I feel like the city, uh, the city council's like the democratic uh, party's <laughs> candidates here in the U S like right. splintering into just 
you know, randomness. Um, how did how did that happen? I think there was a couple of factors. I mean, the the sort of implosion of Vision Vancouver and its after effect. Vision Vancouver is a very effective. It was so different when it came in uh, compared to MPA and Cope, right? So Vision came in with this big model of cohesive sort of a party system at the civic level. That never happened with the MPA. I mean, with the MPA, you used to have councillors yelling at each other from the same party. Vision, they they moved in lockstep. Yeah. Um, they had a really strong housing policy, sort of a increasing density, doing all these things uh, with developers, essentially very pro-developer, in fact, um, but um, having sort of a green face to it and putting in bike lanes. So it was like, oh, don't look at this. Uh, look over here, right? So uh, they were able to do that. The implosion of them and that sort of uh, party discipline system uh, this is, I think, what we're paying for. That in combination with the fact that uh, um, you can't, uh, the whole um, funding and uh, political Fundraising. corporate donations, mm-hmm. union donations being banned from uh, at city level. Um, it's, uh, it's you know, it's very complicated to run a city campaign, to run for a civic election. You, it's like, so it's what, five federal ridings? It's eight provincial ridings. You have to cover the whole city as a candidate. It's an at-large system. So as a candidate, you have to go out there and meet with 500,000, 600,000 people, right? It's, it's really hard. And you're not going to get the same quality of people running that you would at the provincial or federal level because you don't have the professional help that you would get. So it's a combination of those two factors, I think, mm-hmm. leads to this, which is where we are with five different parties amongst 10 councillors. It's just, you know, uh, and and uh, there it's this is a wisdom of the voters, right? I mean, does that sound too bitter? But it's, <laughs> it's the wisdom of the voters is what the voters were looking at. They're confused out there anyways. They want homelessness solved. They want housing solved, but they're not completely enamored with developers and developers look in the industry either. So I think that sort of confusion is what we see reflected in council today. Right. Interesting. It makes me think we had uh, Gordon Price on a long time ago now. Uh, Almost a year ago, probably. But a crisis of confidence with with the development community is there's a crisis of confidence yes. there um, that he was outlining as as a huge challenge right. um, for sure for, for the city of Vancouver right now. If you guys had to grade the current council, and then we'll go through member by member. No, no, <laughs> sure. Gene Swanson. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> no, no, but it, so, so they, it sounds like they, there's a big challenge, right? There, there's uh, five different parties, many competing voices, a challenging uh, situation in the city at large. Um, how are they doing? I, I would like to do the great thing after the show, <laughs> yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, you guys yeah, can yeah. hang Once, around for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting you mentioned Jean Sponsor because in so many ways she she typifies what's happening. I think, which yeah. is she was an activist. She she they they had a siege like one year before. They took over council. They scared all the council away. Council had to had to sit in a different place in the city. Right, the police right. were overwhelmed. Uh, she sat in the council chambers, and as housing activists, homelessness activists, they took over the chambers for almost a day. So all of a sudden she's elected and she has to transition from being an activist and an advocate to being someone who has to be a bit pragmatic. And she, obviously you can see that she's really struggling with that. Pragmatism, you mean. That pragmatism shifting from sort of orthodox thinking to pragmatism and I don't think she's struggling with it. I don't. (laughs) Maybe she's she's nailing it. But but, but, (laughs) to be clear, right, she's voted down every single rental project she's voted down. Because they're not perfect. Yeah. 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 They're good. Well, because she's really, the people she believes she represents are the people that earn less than $30,000, which is... Absolutely fantastic. Obviously, those people need homes and they pro- need a more than anyone in right? this city, True. and they need a representative. The problem is, as I mentioned earlier, you can't build anything new that serves that without with that that um, you know market segment without huge provincial or municipal or federal or whatever it is um, supplements like a you know a subsidization rather. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, so it's it's a foregone conclusion that no matter how affordable, you know, developers can rental housing developers can uh, achieve some cross subsidy within a within a new housing plan by having the, you know, pricing the top floors a little bit more expensive so the bottom floors can be a little less expensive and so on. But you can't get down to like shelter 
rate, like three hundred seventy five dollar a month prices yeah. on new construction. So, which is the only thing she'll accept. Right? Only thing she'll accept. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And the only thing she'll vote for. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, she's just one person, and so therefore largely irrelevant. Um, you know, in the in the council voting scheme, but it is very frustrating to see that vote essentially wasted. It's a protest vote over and over and over again. And her colleague in council, really. Colleen Hardwick. Like, they seem to vote together a lot, right. which is completely odd because they're at very opposite ends of the political spectrum. But Colleen also finds things to be troubling because they're not completely perfect either, right? Yeah. Or she's I like the idea with... of rental housing just not here. Yeah, that's <laughs> just right. Just not the way this not looks. across the street. That's yeah. four stories. My yeah. God, four stories. There is a fantastic slide. I did a little talk with Sonia Trous, who she's the, sort of the grandmother of the Yes in My Backyard movement out of San Francisco go her and I spoke over in Victoria last fall and she has a slide in one of her presentations that is from a little study that was done that basically asked people hypothetically if they would support this new rental housing development that was coming and they asked based on if it was you know would you support it if it was a few kilometers away a kilometer away like a few hundred meters away and you can very ch clearly chart like how support erodes the closer and closer this hypothetical development gets to the person being asked and it's even more of a drop off if that if that hypothetical development has any below market component to it whatsoever yeah, sure. you don't want those people anywhere near yeah. you yeah. so i mean it just undermines to me the you know nine tenths of the nimby argument in the city it is very much a not in my backyard yeah. kind of sentiment that prevents us from moving forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tom Davidoff just uh, released a paper called "Not in My Neighbor's Backyard" about laneway homes. <laughs> <Funny>. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, well, we've got through two council members. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, well yeah, this is the, fun. The, those two are exceptional yeah. because, yeah. again, they'll probably get reelected because they have a name, yeah. they have a constituency, and sure. they're representing their brand really well. Yeah. The other, the other eight are quite moderate and they're trying to be centrist and they're trying to be pragmatic and level-headed. That's going to work against them when they come up against yeah. 70 people running against them. That's the incredible part of this, right? Is that actually trying to get stuff done, put your head down, do the work. Yeah. Uh, yes. It, you get political Doesn't get you noticed. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I wonder, like, you've got an MPA. MPA is for, I'm sure everyone knows, but it's like Vancouver's oldest civic party. I think they're a little over 80 years old now. Um, and they're probably the best brand now that Vision's gone, I guess, still in the game. And they have five, five now? No, four, five council members because Rebecca's not with them Rebecca's anymore. Rebecca's not with them, so they just so have four. Four city council members. Um, but their board recently took a bit of a turn to the right when they had their AGM back in December. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it remains to be seen what the, their you know, three or two and a bit years from now when they put together their next slate, um, how that looks, because obviously they already had one. Uh, council person leave uh, because she didn't agree with the politics of the board. Um, but the other more interesting thing is, you know, we've got a, a homelessness and an opioid crisis here. Uh, you know, if you've got a far right party that maybe takes a tough on crime approach, I worry about that doing well in a city like this, uh, mm. you know, because you do have a lot of people that will, you know, you see this even down south where they'll tell you one thing and then vote a different way when they're alone in the booth. Um, there are a lot of people, especially when we were on the campaign trail la a couple of years ago now, almost a couple of years ago, that you there was a lot of visceral anger in neighborhoods like Crosstown and uh, Chinatown, downtown east side around the city, uh, just sort of not really getting it right, I guess, charitably, right. but, you know, ignoring them <laughs> probably less charitably. Um, in terms of your inter interpretation of what the city's doing. So I worry that that dynamic has a couple years to fester and, and some a group like the MPA could could run on that to mm -hmm. some extent. You saw yeah, Wei could. Young try to do it I mean, in the, 2018. For me, the right. issue with the board and the, and the caucus, the elected officials, is not. That's, you know, there's pretty much a firewall there as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. but they don't really impact on how the decisions are made okay. by the councillors. However, they do ha select who's going to run next time. <laughs> so that 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 will yeah. impact it. Yeah, for sure. And They'll, you saw, I mean, they they hard selected last time around. They were yeah. like, no, thank you, Hector. Not me. Yeah. Not you. <laughs> not me, not you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember, I mean, Greg Baker was like replying to me and journalists saying like he's not running for us you know he was the party president he's since been fired but <laughs>
<laughs> so yes, the MPA does exercise some pretty extreme control over who runs for them. Yeah, and that'll be interesting to see two years down the road how that will impact yeah. what their slate looks like. Yeah. Because quite frankly, the people that they do get elected are usually the more left or, or centrist kind of people. That's who the voters want from the MPA. So True. we'll see who the MPA puts forward next time. Um, and the other party is the Green Party, right? So the Greens have three as well. Uh, yeah. The MPA have three, the Greens have three. And uh, um, that's also a party that's a bit struggling because it's always been able to be the advocates and the activists and not really have to have leadership or show leadership in a pragmatic way. And this is why they're, I think, struggling between how they're going to enact policy within the city. Because you see different takes from Mike Weeb, from from Pete Fry, from Adrian Carr. They're all very different people and they're all very, they take very different approaches. They vote against each other from time to time more often probably than I would uh, that, that, that I would think um, but that's another party that's there mm -hmm. but the green party is full of contradictions I think it was um, was it Pete Fry that was advocating on saving the hedges in that 21 unit uh, townhouse development so there was that yeah. 20, 45 75 Granville was 21 rental townhouses um, that was proposed for one mansion lot um, right and one of the reasons that he had for turning it down is that the hedge would be uh, sort of taken out as part of that development. So there's- Which we should pause to think about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just how I mean, inherently weird and conflicted they are. Like you are literally advocating for green <laughs> as the color, yeah. not green in terms of green land use. It's bizarre. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so if uh, it sounds like you guys are, the verdict's still out on this council. Um, Two years from now, uh, two questions. Would you, would you run again? Uh, do you think we'll have, see more cohesion? Uh, is this kind of a blip and we'll, we'll get back to some sort of cohesive party? And, and is Kennedy Stewart still, still the mayor? Well, there's a lot of questions. Yeah, three. <laughs> you said two, and then he asked five. Yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could add two more. If uh, like. Well, I don't, I mean, I think I'd be interested in turning over why, like, 71 um, candidates ran for city council last time around for 10 city council uh, spots. And, I mean, it's, like, at the time it made sense to me why so many people were doing it. Now I can't remember why. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, people saw it as a sort of a generational opportunity. There was a lot of turnover. So, hey, I'm going to do this. There's there also, was no incumbents, right? Running, yeah, really. right. Vision, Just decline of vision. So that would have, yep. yeah. And then also it's like uh, 100 bucks deposit. So you get that back. And 25 signatures to be able to run. I mean, like... We need to raise that. Right. Yeah, and that is being discussed right now. Who is yeah. um, council? Remember Roller Girl? Yep. Uh, yep. Oh, there's yeah. a lot of great ones. Watermelon yeah. guitar. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Roller Girl. Roller girl. Yeah. 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 I mean, there were two, how many uh, mayoral candidates? There was something like ten or sixteen or yeah, I can't remember. So, but seventy-one council candidates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if that if the field looks like it's going to shape up like that again, you need a brand behind you. Unfortunately, I think it's in Vancouver, like the only major Canadian city that has municipal parties. Seems uh, like it. Yeah. But yeah. you can see why. Right. When and you, you look at the ballot, why. you need a shorthand. Yeah. Voters need a shorthand when they see all those names. It's overwhelming. It, right? We were talking yeah. about that before we came on air, but it, it is crazy. It's it is overwhelming. And I that's feel like the number we one here. Fairly like I think we did podcasts on it before the election and I still went in yeah. there and I was like I'm no expert but yeah, yeah those the no amount of names doing. you're like yeah and I think I think also with people's attention spans these days I mean oh yeah it's like it's a it's a tough way to vote yeah. for sure yeah low attention voters right low information voters so yeah. and it, 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 one of the funniest events was I think the lottery for Oh yes, the, right. it used to be alphabetical ballot, right? Oh, so they decided right, they would right. randomize it and stuff. Yeah. So they had this lottery, and everybody went there, and it was we were all it was just all candidates sitting yeah. in the council chambers, and they they put, they put they everyone's name, first, like, and then they pulled the name out, and the guy was screaming. It was Jason yeah. Lamarche. He right. goes, "I win, I win." That's what he said. It was just <laughs> he's, he's was since letters. left Vancouver. Eh? Oh, I, I didn't know that. I'm not sure. I think he he's left Vancouver. I used to follow him on. See, some some social media. Okay. Well, I don't think ultimately I don't think any of that had any bearing. I was like super stoked that I got sixth out of seventy one. Yeah. Council With the candidate. idea it being didn't matter. That most people would just go and maybe you're first, just it's easier to yeah. find. But I think it was a mess. Um, ultimately, like it, it, alphabetical for especially in the case when you have seventy one candidates is probably a pretty 
you know, a good way for you to immediately find the people you want to vote for if you've done any research beforehand. And instead, we scrambled the whole thing for you. Like, yeah. great. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't think they'll do that again. They should I, I not. Think that was sort of yeah, the was a bad idea. Yeah. Staff report was indicating that. But there is a power to incumbency. So if all these 10 are going to run again, there yeah. is that power to you. You're going to be battling that if you're going to run. Right. So that's that's a big challenge. But it sounds like there's going. you think there's going to be fewer candidates next time around. I don't think so. Not necessarily. It, it's, it's awkward, right? Because you put your name in and you think, oh, there's only going to be 40 people. And you don't find out until the list is put out. Like mm -hmm. uh, the weekend, the weekend after mm -hmm. you, everybody files. And that's when you find out and you go, oh, crap. Yes. <laughs> so many more people. Can I withdraw? No, yeah, I mean, late. we are already, like, as independent candidates, there was actually a lot of really good buzz around independence last time uh, in 2018. Sure. And there was some, that Conseco poll that had independence at, like, you know, above greens and like, you know, if independents were a party, we'd be laughing. Unfortunately, independents were about 47 people or something that they had to split right. votes between. So it just doesn't break down well. And uh, so, but I think we, you know, we still had our eyes pretty wide open. I mean, Rob is not new to this and I'm, you know, not either with a little less experience mm -hmm. than Rob, obviously. But, um, but would we do it again? Uh, I mean, I won't speak for Rob. I would consider it, but you look at what's going on now, you've got like, essentially 11 individuals in there, you know, 10 counselors plus the mayor that are putting forward their own, I don't want to call them pet motions, but like some of them literally are pet motions. I think Pete's aggressive dog policy is coming to. That's right. <laughs> in any case, yeah, so we're really tackling the tough issues. Um, you know, sinking our teeth, wigging it up more dog puns in here. <laughs> but uh, I, I think I'd be discouraged spending, you know, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights till 10 or 11 because you're just slogging through a bunch of work of your own creation that yeah. isn't really moving the city forward. Uh, certainly not in the files that I feel are, you know, most needed, like housing and, and transportation. So right. It's, right. we'll have to see how it shapes up in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. It's tough, right? It's a big financial hit. It's yeah. a big family hit. It's a personal hit yeah. to just to run. Yeah. And uh, certainly you have your eyes open about what your chances are. But um, I also think neither of us feel completely compelled to run. So it's like you do it just to serve, to be mm -hmm. part of things, right? To be involved and engaged. And I think that's why you do it. So right. and you do it if you right. think you can make a difference. And I think going back to the you know, whether you choose inside or outside of the um, political realm to make a difference, I think it just comes down to what your motivations are and where you think you can make the most difference. And so far, I guess by default, I've been doing it outside of that system. So, well, you know, that's been gratifying. Right. So it seems like we've talked uh, a bit about the city plan, not super optimistic by the sounds of things, uh, as far as I can tell uh, coming from you guys. City Council, we're not super optimistic about where there are. <laughs> oh, are, are we, we're, we, are you guys optimistic about uh, the city of Vancouver, say in the next five to 10 to 20 and beyond years here? Can we get our, can we get our act together? Yes. <laughs> A lot of deep breaths. Yeah. No, of course. Uh, of course we're optimistic. I'm optimistic. Yeah. You have to be, right? People are going to keep coming here. We've created this fantastic city where everyone wants to live. Like, is that a bad thing? Yeah. I mean, you know, the fact that people are attracted to come here and live here and work here and play here. It's like, it's, it's a fantastic place. And it will always be, I think. Yeah. Well, I think... Like we were talking about this as we walked in around the frame of the Olympics, whether or not I guess there's this idea that Vancouver gets the Olympics back in 2030 or at least makes a play to do that. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 And I hear a lot of people, I'll let Rob weigh in with his opinion, but I hear a lot of people ragging on this online, like this is a terrible idea. Um, but, you know, the Olympics brought us a lot of pretty great things. I mean, with a few bumps, it brought us Olympic Village. Obviously, the city had to jump in there and take over a, a lot of that development. Um, but now it's a great example, minus an elementary school. And it also brought us the Canada line, you know, uh, so maybe we go and get the Olympics again and amortize some of these prior investments and build some new thing. Maybe we upzone some great swaths of the city and build a SkyTrain all the way out to UBC like we should yeah. be doing the first time around and mm -hmm. all sorts of, you know, other fantastic investments. Maybe that's the way we shock the system into growing. Yeah. I... I obviously love Vancouver. I live right downtown. I've bought into that Vancouver dream. Um, I'm a little discouraged to see at the provincial level um, them not keeping pace with that. They, um, 
you know, on the schools issue, they're just doing sort of seismic upgrades in Vancouver, not really new schools. They're saving new schools for outside of Vancouver. Uh, they released, or they didn't really release it. They had a growth strategy drafted for the metro area that talked about forcing a lot of the growth out of Vancouver in terms of jobs and housing as a way of sort of, I don't know, dispersing growth or something, like actively curtailing growth in the major downtown yeah, core. which seems to be a policy from 40 to yeah. 50 years ago, right? They were lauding to... San Jose in the Bay Area for how that, I mean, that's Look a at the nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> so some of the, I just, I don't get a great urbanist take from, um, well, really John Horgan's government at all. Um, so while they may be good partners for some projects, they're, they don't have a great um, city building vision. Um, so hopefully we can get a council in here next time that actually has a majority and can make something happen. I think that would be really important to the city is to get a majority for sure. Even six of the 10 councillors, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the, we were hopeful after this that like after that last election that you'd have some informal group band together, you know. The right, Greens I think and, that was it was kind of the wait and see, right? Like something might cohere. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. It didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's sort of a foregone conclusion, like even the Greens don't, re- or I mean, they didn't really caucus, maybe they do now. No. MPA certainly doesn't have a caucus. Um, so if you can't even agree within your own party, you're not going to suddenly, you know, build a bridge to another one. So mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And it's, and, and as I understand this, instead of, instead of uh, lofty citywide plans, get six out of 10 on council, plow through a couple of community plans, get mm-hmm. to work. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean that, you know, if I was encouraged when I came in here today and you were talking about having Gil on and how he was, I mean, I got to go and listen to that episode now. I'm going to go home and listen to it for sure about how he was sort of talking about big dreams and that, um, you know, it should be within to some extent his power to, to get some of that done or to lean on uh, mayor and council to try to, uh, to try to put something on the table that would get some of that done. I, I think we are really lucky that we have Gil Kelly. Me too. Absolutely. Like, yeah. And and Lon LeClaire is of course yeah. the, Lon's the great. city engineer and and uh, Sadu has really come around from the Penny Ballant day. So, you know, we do have really good people in those right. key positions and I yep. think we're really lucky because especially with this lack of political cohesion or direction or leadership, uh, we're going to rely on those people to keep us moving forward. And we do have, like, I have total confidence in that team, right? Mm -hmm. In the corporate management team and the city. So we're fortunate about that. You're right. So Sadhu Johnston is the city manager for anyone who doesn't know. And I, you know, when we were watching council for probably like really avidly, or at least when I was for the first year or so after not being elected, um, (laughs) it was Sadhu (laughs) that kept that group on the rails quite yeah. frankly like they were lost when it came to procedure when it came to what they could well, this is what Frances Bula we've had her on the show a couple of times yeah. and she's the, you know <laughs> it's like literally figuring out where the bathroom is that's oh, like the like, first three months yeah, it's like you know, oh, yeah. that's not that's yeah. not a metaphor yeah. 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 yeah yeah he was the one that would just sort of ke- keep them from getting inadvertently sued by some you know by someone on, because of some decision they made one night you know like yeah. so it, we're very fortunate to have that uh, quote unquote like institutional memory and if they can stick around for another regime that hopefully has a bit of a clearer mandate you know i hope it's the right mandate i do fear that um you know the mpa has been a little more center right in the past and it, the old axis of right maybe equaling more of a conservationist stance i don't know if that's necessarily true anymore but if it is still true and you get like a lot of the west side voting the mpa and Maybe we're not in a good growth position mm. with uh, an MPA majority. I'm not sure. So it right. depends what that party looks like two years from now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, is it the party of Gordon Price or is it the party of George Poole, right? I mean, they did bring in the downtown South plan, which gave us all of Yale Town, sure. all that, yeah. you know, 80,000 homes. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a good question. Which party the MPA will be? Yeah, that's the that's an interesting part about that that party specifically, right? Is that it's... Wears many different hats or oh, can. Oh, completely. It's an yeah. empty vessel between, yeah. right? That's that's what they call well, it. Well, and you've still got other parties like Yes Vancouver had some fundraiser a couple of weeks ago. I didn't go. I don't know how it went. It was 50 bucks a plate. <laughs> but, you know, so there are other and groups. this is Hector Bremner's. Uh, I'm not sure if he's Hector still, in, still oh, involved. I don't know. I don't know found, who's organizing that. Founding member, that. past guest. I bumped yeah. into <laughs> Stephanie Butler, Butler, right? Yeah. Who was one of their candidates or one of their council candidates. And I had asked her, like, are you organizing this or are you going to this? And I don't think the answer to either of those was yes. So I don't know who is behind all that. Um, hmm. It's not Mark. No, not is it sure. Mark? Mark Marison, maybe? I don't, I'm not I sure. don't know. Anyways. 
Well, it sounds like uh, at the at the very least we're in the muddy middle here. Oh yes, <laughs> very much. Yeah. yeah, but we do have. I think that's uh, we should we should maybe, hit the five. Maybe wire. leave it there. And yeah, can you, we have this segment called the Five Wire? Five questions about mm. you in Vancouver. Mm. Can you cool. stick around for that? Sure, of course. Okay, so question number one: What is your favorite neighborhood? We'll start with Rob. Yale Town. That was easy. Oh, I would say Yale Town as well. Really? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Probably. Aww. Well, I live there too. Come I'm on. Like, I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> I was not one of the original. <laughs> well, right, you came from North Van, if I remember correctly. No, I grew up in Port Moody. I did li- live briefly in, um, in North Van. But the first place I moved into in Yale Town was actually in 1999. So, but then I moved to Mexico and other places too. Right. <laughs> Favorite bar or restaurant? And doesn't have to be in Yale Town. I don't make it out much any, anymore with kids. Five, with five know? kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and sadly, we've been going to like Boston Pizza at the stadium, <laughs> Boston Pizza, because it's, it's like six ninety nine for a family, yeah. you know, like a kid's meal. Yeah, so that's not terribly hip. Yeah. <laughs> Matt Matt is now <laughs> like, going to Boston Pizza. I don't know about that deal. Six ninety nine. <laughs> you get three courses. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, there are a couple. There's a place called um, uh, Bartholomew now in... Um, Yale Town, which I think when they were originally launching, they were going to call it Bartholomew's Plan, which is Harlan oh. Bartholomew, right. Bartholomew gave us a lot of our modern zoning code back in the 30s. Oh. It's an American planner, and a lot of it is super racist. So that wasn't a great <laughs> oh, name. Oh, right. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> racist. So yeah, I think yeah, they just shortened it to Bartholomew, but it's a fantastic like charcuterie cocktail place in Yale Town. So when an, like, I can get an adult night, I'll go there. Where is that? On mainland. Like, on mainland. Uh, oh. thousand block of mainland. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I and my know. local is New Oxford, so it's just oh easy. yeah, it's easy. Donnelly Group, sometimes Morrissey, <laughs> Morrissey. Yeah. yeah, this is we're Morrissey we must at pass. Davy and Granville, right? Yep. Drake and Granville. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah that's a between. good. Uh, yeah, that's been around still for ages. Hold. Yeah, <laughs> uh, a long time. Okay, we and you you got these written down. I'm yeah. Having... So um, one <laughs> one book that you would recommend that every listener should should oh, write. Right. right. Oh, uh, we'll start with Rob. Um, Chuck Montgomery's book on Happy City. He's uh, been on the which, he's been on the show. Yeah. So he and one of the chapters is about me. So. Oh, really? Oh, there you go. I've read that book. I didn't. You read I didn't about put me. two two and two together. I was the guy who lived in the tower and was sad, and then I moved down to the townhouse and I was happy. Oh, right. All my he friends told were that there. story. Didn't he tell oh, the story on the show? Maybe? He does his presentation. Yeah, and he yeah. has a big picture of my face, like it's on stage. It's like <laughs> horrific. <laughs> Yeah, and is that uh, is that doesn't. a simplified story or is that it's actually what happened? Simplified, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's kind of what happened. Yeah, yeah. Right uh, for me, probably this is not a city building book. Although I, you know, I would say, um, the, oh, geez, that no, what's Nathan Loster's book? The life. Oh, yeah. oh the, life and death of the, the single, single family, family home. Right. Yeah. I mean, that would be a good one to read for specific to Vancouver. Uh, but one that I think explains a lot of sort of human um, psychology is The Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz, um, which is a good explainer for just why we're so paralyzed by an overwhelming amount of choice in today's world and how sometimes uh, less is more. So. Mm-hmm. One. one piece of advice you would give your 18-year-old self coming from two guys who have wildly successful and put yourself out there. Wildly successful. That is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, I now my oldest is closing in on 14. So like my, so they're right now, all my kids are like 13, 12, 11, 10 and eight. Um, so like at the countdown, basically is what the, you call the group of them. <laughs> so I've got almost give this advice to them. Um, sheesh. I think it's been more fulfilling for me to chase a bunch of things that represent my interests than it is to chase a singular vocation. And, um, so I, you know, when I started writing that blog, I did it because I just had a thing I wanted to talk about and it brought all sorts of cool people and things in that's probably nine tenths of the reason why we're sitting here and chatting. Right. Mm-hmm. So just follow your passion. It's super trite. The older I get, the more I realize all these like, you know, just na- napkin kind of cliche, kind of cliche yeah, fortune yeah. cookie <laughs> sayings where you used to roll your eyes at are like, yeah, that's pretty much true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really is, isn't it? That's sad. Uh, um, reap what you sow, right? So you put love into something, you'll get it back. I, I think that's so true. And with anything, it just is about the, the is it long-term or short-term, but you always get it back. So, yeah. 
don't be afraid to put love out there. Yeah. Put interest and gauge out there, right? It's just like, yeah, it comes back to you. Fantastic. And last but not least. Yeah. So something that you have bought recently for under a thousand dollars that's had a positive impact on your life. Oh, a cat. You got a cat? <laughs> what? No, for under a thousand dollars? Yeah. Cat. <laughs> got a special cat. You know, oh, I've never had a cat before. My partner always wanted a cat. So I was like, okay, we'll get a cat. We went to this SPCA up the street, which is so depressing. It's just walls of cats and cages. It's like they're all rescued. And there was one cat. It was just like... Oh, now I'm a cat guy, I guess. So we have this cat at home. It's like, wow, it's totally changed my life. It's a cat. More so yeah. than moving down a... to the townhouse there. Yeah. <laughs> no. But not that much. I would think not that that's, that's had a big the cat has had a big impact on my life for sure. Oh, that's funny. Um, I had been thinking of this like little so I don't know if you've gone on my site and looked at the sort of the floor plan or there used to be like a virtual tour of the place doesn't work anymore unfortunately i got to get a new one done but my bedroom has like a murphy bed in it that you can flip up and put a desk down and all sorts of cool stuff and i had one other use i wanted to get out of that room which was as sort of like a movie theater so you know you could be in bed and then there'd be like a projector and a screen in front of you and for under a thousand bucks, I put that together recently. So I think the screen was a couple hundred bucks and the projector was 500 bucks. And I already had a set of speakers I could throw behind it. And the projector just sort of sits on top of the, you know, the Murphy bed sort of frame or whatever. And, you know, the screen is on the other end of the room. And man, that is cool. Like it's, <laughs> you know, because obviously I've, you know, a bunch of other kids and they sometimes have friends over and they're all using all various other parts of the, the condo. Um, so I can kind of retreat to there and, you know, turn the blinds and just watch movies or whatever, or even have a kid in there and or two and hang out and watch something. And it's just is, it's, yeah, especially, I mean, it's sunny right now as we look out this window, but like the winter we've just gone through, uh, yeah. it's been a lifesaver. So <laughs> No kidding. And I think I saw a, a tour of your place on YouTube at one point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Kristen Dirksen does, um, she's built quite a YouTube channel. I think she's got like a million some odd followers and that as if you've been viewed like a couple million times that tour i still wow. people get like will recognize me from that not anything else yeah from that in vancouver so she yeah. must have tons of viewers wow yeah that's a big movement right now i mean i feel like uh, a lot of youtube channels on small small homes and oh, efficient living and i'm totally missing the boat on monetizing this it's no <laughs> kidding i haven't written a book don't have a youtube channel i was gonna say I'm you were cutting your this. teeth on that two years one of the first <laughs> exactly yeah even todd talbot's in that space now yeah. eh? <laughs> well thanks so much for your time guys that was a really interesting conversation and appreciate you coming down to the studio Thank you. Yeah, and where and, oh, yeah, and right. where, where can people find out more about what you're doing and uh, about you specifically? All of my random links are on adriancrook.net currently. Yeah. yeah. So. And Great. I'm robertmcdowell.ca. Awesome. Well, we'd love to have you guys back in the future. And yeah, thanks again. Thanks. Thank you.